If you care about transit, you may have heard that the MBTA in Boston has shut down the entire Orange Line and a part of the Green Line that forms the Green Line extension, which only opened earlier this year. Unfortunately, this type of situation that the MBTA is currently facing is not unique for American transit. Over most of the last year, the once showpiece Washington Metro has had service that would be more appropriate for a minor regional rail system rather than a metro system in the capital of the most powerful country in the world. Now, I don't think that just hopping on the doom train and just complaining about the situation is really something where I can provide a ton of value to people. People are and should be frustrated. But I think these problems are really just a symptom of a larger problem with the way transit systems are planned, operated, and constructed in the United States. A pattern which means they struggle to achieve ridership, are very failure prone, and often don't achieve a major modal shift away from cars and onto transit. They're also extremely concerning fuel for the completely nonsensical fire that exists around the idea that transit is somehow irrelevant now that some people spend some of their time working at home. I think this type of transit may be best described as frail, and in today's video, I'm going to tell you all about it. So what's going on in Boston? Well, right now, two lines on Boston's system are seeing shutdowns, most notably the Orange Line, which cuts across the city from north to south and is in a very bad state of repair. Over the past several months and years, the line has seen incident after incident, including a well-publicized recent fire on a train. Now, as you might imagine, the Orange Line is not helped by its old, old trains, which were supposed to be largely replaced with new trains from Chinese railcar maker CRRC. But those trains have had a ton of issues, and so the fleet has not been completely replaced and is not in a great state. All of this has led the agency to decide that the best course of action is to shut the entire line down for a month and then try to do tons of repairs and the like to get things back onto track. Now, as someone who relies on a subway line to get around my city, the idea that the MBTA would just shut down a major transit artery for a month with so little notice is honestly shocking, and it's punishing for people in Boston who rely on transit, especially those who do not have a lot of other options. The simple reality is that there are a lot of places where people generally like the idea of transit, and then there are places where people actually use transit en masse as their primary way of traveling long distances through their city. And the reality simply is that as less and less people use transit, even if they generally support transit, they deprioritize it, even if they don't mean to. And that leads to a user experience and ridership death spiral. Unless you have to directly deal with the consequences of poor operations and management by riding the system, you just don't understand how bad things are getting or if they're actually improving. And I think that's something you see in a lot of American cities. Now, there has been some talk that a shutdown like this is pretty unprecedented in a major city like Boston, but that's not entirely true. Cities from London to Madrid do sometimes shut down lines or portions of lines for some period of time, often for major works like a major station reconstruction or a regaging. These shutdowns are inconvenient and painful, but not nearly as painful as what we're seeing in Boston, probably in large part because they're communicated long in advance, which isn't true with the current Orange Line shutdown. At the same time, they pretty consistently bring a guarantee of a majorly improved service or station or other piece of infrastructure when the system reopens. And people get used to the trend of a system shutting down part of its network, improving itself, and then reopening in a couple months or a year and being far better. In the case of Boston, the shutdown is different because it feels like a last ditch effort to fix things that are already spiraling out of control. And honestly, this might not even be the worst course of action. But the fact that things got here is the real problem. And any major decision like this cements transit as something that is less and less vital to people's lives. And it doesn't help that in most American cities, you couldn't get away with the same thing with shutting down a major highway with so little notice. In that way, these kind of radical moves are cyclical. Doing this sort of shutdown or massively reducing frequency makes transit something people don't think they can rely on and don't have faith in. They won't build their lives around transit and they won't regularly use it. And that only makes it easier to do this kind of radical shutdown in the future. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be so bad if you were in a place like the Netherlands, where transit shutdowns have actually happened. The issue is, while the dominant form of mobility is driving a car, when you force people out of transit, you're forcing them into driving. And while Boston has provided some alternatives to people, like free bike share during the disruption, it just isn't going to make up for the loss of capacity on the Orange Line. 
Now, I also do want to point out that this type of nearly overnight transit service reduction has happened in other places in the United States, probably most notably in Washington, D.C., where an issue was discovered with a particular type of train model that's used across the entire D.C. metro. And since this model of train is used so widely and now comprises such a large part of DC's fleet, service had to be cut back radically as much of the fleet was taken out of service so that issues could be investigated and trains could eventually be repaired. This means that the DC Metro has only been seeing trains a couple times an hour rather than every few minutes as it should. Now, I think that given that both of these cities are major American cities and are really important to the economy and political functioning of the nation, it's almost unbelievable that their transit could be so radically scaled back so quickly. But it highlights an effect of what I would call frail transit that's fairly common in the United States and does have elements in some smaller Canadian cities as well. Despite what it might sound like, this isn't necessarily bad transit, but rather transit that needs to work uphill to succeed in the context of the United States. Sometimes these solutions and systems have huge positives, but they also often have structural issues that lead to more problems down the road. The first and most obvious one, especially in the case of Boston, is the weak network connectivity seen in these rapid transit systems in cities like Boston and Chicago. Such radial rail networks are inevitably going to be quite susceptible to disruption because a single failure along a line could shut down most of the line, or at least render it mostly non-functional, since riders cannot continue to the important central transfer point to other lines and other destinations. In a system with more crosstown connectivity, you might not be able to make your trip as quickly if a portion of a radial line shuts down, but you'll still be able to make it, and that's really critical to keeping a transit system functioning. Now, yes, there are buses, commuter rail, and other forms of transit in many of these cities, but the reality is that while Boston and Washington DC don't have the world's greatest transit systems, they do have some of the most successful transit systems in the United States, and that means replacing the capacity and service of a rapid transit line with buses and other modes of transit is really difficult. In a city like London, if a line needs to be shut down, it's not great, but it is manageable, and that's why it happens sometimes. And that's because there's usually lots of alternate routes people can take, whether that be via other tube lines or even mainline rail and other modes that can pick up the slack. What that means inversely is that each individual line in a system as large as London Underground isn't as important relative to the whole system as a single line might be in Boston or Washington DC, since there's just less lines overall. A single line like the Orange Line going out of service in Boston means an entire sector of the city is without rapid transit service, and that just generally wouldn't be the case in a city like London. Of course, these issues with network connectivity could also be addressed with more circumferential or blooping routes, which would allow those trying to divert around disruption to just travel over to the next radial and use that to get into town. But we're not seeing nearly enough of these projects. One of the few we are seeing is actually in Washington DC with the Maryland Purple Line. But unfortunately in this case, the choice of technology will likely effectively limit speed and frequency, which will limit the overall usefulness of that line. Now, none of this is meant to suggest that you can't have a decent decent metro network with a lot of radial lines. You definitely can. It just becomes a lot less reasonable with a city the scale of Chicago or Boston, which are big cities that move enough people on their rail systems that buses and other forms of transit can't easily pick up the slack. DC has another one of the largest underappreciated problems in the modern US metro systems like it and BART, which is somewhat counterintuitive, and that's that I think the trains and stations are probably too large. This might sound weird because in many videos I've made, I celebrate systems which have large eight or 10 car trains as being really impressive, future-proofed, and just having cool engineering. But the reality appears to be that in the United States, having trains that are oversized for the service you're running usually just leads to an atrophy of service. More frequent trains tend to encourage more ridership and be generally more convenient, which then leads to demand, which leads to more service and it creates a virtuous cycle. But more service also costs more money. And that's especially true when you have an operator or two operators on every single train. And so having larger trains enables a sort of perverse incentive where it's more affordable to provide the same capacity with larger rather than more frequent trains, all in a bid to save money. And this often happens in a way that ends up discouraging ridership growth. Of course, this provides the same theoretical capacity as smaller trains operating more frequently, but the issue is that without the service frequency, you don't attract nearly as many riders. It also leads to sloppier operations, since the margins for error are a lot larger when you're operating only a few trains per hour rather than a train every few minutes. 
And this problem is a problem that you do see all around the world to different extents. Up here in Toronto, we have similar problems in York Region, which always seems to have our transit problems. And that said, in York Region, you sometimes see articulated bendy buses being used to reduce frequency on bus routes. Instead of accommodating more riders with more and more convenient buses, you have less buses providing the same capacity. Of course, as I mentioned before, a large part of DC's problems have been because a large portion of its fleet is an identical train model. This is something you often see because of a bit of an obsession with austerity and economies of scale. In many metro and transit systems, you see smaller orders of vehicles more regularly, which often leads to reduced costs for individual vehicles, but also more vehicles on hand at any given time. You also often see separate or mostly separate fleets for different lines or groups of lines on a network, even if the train models are fundamentally the same. And all of that leads to systems which have fleets that are more resilient, where a problem with a single type of equipment doesn't lead to you having to cut service so massively. Now, you can make a similar argument for not running very small trains at very high headways, like say on the Copenhagen Metro, because any system under stress is prone to failure. But the reality is that higher frequency still always gives you the benefit of the convenience of higher frequency. And there are very few systems in the United States and in North America in general that lack the capacity for more frequencies. So I don't really think that's a huge issue here. Probably the ultimate piece of the frail transit puzzle is poor service. Much like how when you have many metro lines, it's a lot easier to handle the random issues you might have with a single line much more easily. When you run less service, you inevitably make the importance of each individual trip much higher, as well as increasing the disruption caused by a single operational glitch. The New York subway, for example, does often have a lot of disruptions and reroutes and problems, but the system still rolls along and manages to work quite well because it has a lot of service that it can use to recover from those issues. Of course, with frail transit, I could go on and probably make more videos. So if you're interested in that, leave a comment down below. From transit that runs along streets and puts itself at the mercy of prioritized automobile traffic, as well as politicians who will water down transit priority to placate car driving residents, to disintegrated and confusing fare systems, to high operating costs, a poor state of repair, and poor cleanliness. All of these issues make problems leading to a system shutdown or other issue that drives away ridership much more likely. And they make the problems you do have much harder to recover from. Ultimately, I've always believed that transit begets transit, and each thing which discourages ridership or makes transit more inconvenient or unpredictable just further hurts ridership, which all goes to reduce resistance to things like service cuts and things like month-long shutdowns to fix things that shouldn't need to be fixed with a month-long shutdown. Of course, all of this only fuels the notion that transit is inevitably unreliable and not a good way of getting around. And this is especially concerning because nobody in Japan or Germany Germany or anywhere else where transit is generally quite well run is seriously suggesting that transit is really going to be less relevant in the wake of the pandemic. That's in the same way that a state DOT in the US probably isn't canceling a highway expansion just because there's going to be less commuting in the future. Tackling all of these things helps fix structural problems that make transit unattractive. It's time to stop depending on people wanting to ride transit because they like the idea of it, and instead by making transit the most convenient, affordable, and reliable choice for people. Thanks for watching.